Good morning, everyone. If you joined us yesterday evening for day one of the symposium, then welcome back. And if it's your first time here, then welcome to our second annual Anti-Oppression in Healthcare and Sciences Symposium. This symposium began last year as an initiative funded through the EDI Action Fund, granted by the Office of Inclusion and Diversity for the Tumurti Faculty of Medicine. This symposium is an opportunity for students within the Tumurti Faculty of Medicine who have been doing anti-oppression work to share their research and other initiatives with the broader public. It was organized by the U of T Faculty of Medicine Learner Equity Action and Discussion Committee, also known as LEAD Committee, in collaboration with the U of T Faculty of Medicine Office of Inclusion and Diversity. Anti-oppression work can sometimes feel very isolating and daunting, especially when navigating through these structures that have existed for many decades, if not centuries. We hope you'll leave this symposium inspired to engage further into anti-oppression projects as we spend the day learning more about what our colleagues and future healthcare professionals have been doing to confront and dismantle oppressive structures and norms. So now I would like to introduce Anita, the Director of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion at the Office of Inclusion and Diversity for a land acknowledgement. Thanks so much, Bisma, for that introduction uh, and for kind of opening us up to this uh, exciting second day of this uh, symposium. Really happy to be here. So I have the privilege of, of starting us off with the land acknowledgement. So this land acknowledgement um, has been co-created uh, at the University of Toronto, um, the Center for Faculty Development and our office. Uh, it's an opportunity to not just acknowledge the land, but reflect on our own um, social locations, our own locations on the land. Uh, so I'd invite all of you as I'm reading out this acknowledgement to do your own uh, reflection wherever you are, wherever you're dialing in from today. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Faculty of Medicine operates. For thousands and thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We want to recognize that we are gathered in an institution with a colonial history, uh, and, and which continues to present day, and that we should work to address ongoing colonial harms. Land acknowledgements are only a starting point for larger conversations and more concrete acts of restitution and transformation are needed to address underlying inequities and blatant discrimination in the distribution of resources between Canada's first peoples and settlers. So on a date like today, when we are talking about anti-oppression, especially in research, uh, the work that's happening on the ground constantly by, by groups trying to resist oppression within our society. Um, when we're thinking about healthcare research, I think in particular reflecting on the harms that have been per perpetuated uh, towards Indigenous communities and continue to be. Uh, I recently read this really wonderful article um, that was co-written by Sarah Hyatt, um, a medical student within the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, along with collaborators Stacy Margeresson and Chelsea Gable. Uh, it was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, just, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's about improving health research among Indigenous peoples in Canada. And I'm going to quote directly from the article where they state that historically, owing to a dominant Western science paradigm, Indigenous methods, methodologies, epistemologies, knowledge and perspectives have been dismissed as unsuitable for health research. And as such, Indigenous health research frequently remains poorly aligned with the goals and values of Indigenous peoples. Furthermore, research involving Indigenous peoples has been tainted by historical atrocities. The process of reconciliation in Canada should include the indigenization of health research, which will contribute to deconstruction of colonial control. So I thought that was really telling in helping us to frame how to think about some of the issues we're talking about today, thinking about 
past colonial harms and how they've continued into the present for indigenous peoples, for black people, um, for you know, quote unquote, marginalized communities across uh, our spaces. So with that, I'd like to, um, again, invite you to continue reflecting on this as we go through the, the symposium. And I will turn it now over to Gagan Singh, who's going to lead us through uh, the introductions for our next part of the agenda. Thanks so much. Sure, right, thank, uh, thanks for that uh, land acknowledgement, Anita. Um, so this next session's theme um, is entitled Identifying Barriers and Transformative Strategies for Anti-Oppressive Health Education and Research. So in this block, we have three presentations. The first joint present, uh, presenters uh, will be uh, Tanjot Gill and Samira Omar. And so Tanjot Gill is an occupational therapy student at the University of Toronto in her final year of the program and has been involved with the student idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility committee in the occupational therapy program for two years. Uh, Samira Omar is a PhD candidate in the Occupational Science uh, at the Rehabilitation Sciences University of Toronto and have been involved in the Student IDEA Committee in the Occupational Therapy Program as well for two years. Uh, the second joint presenters are Sabrine Salim and Mame Darkwa. Sabrine Salim is currently a second year Master of Health Sciences student in the Translational Research Program, and she is currently working alongside Toronto General Hospital to develop a pandemic protocol for organ transplantation, and is also interested in using her understanding of health equity and advocacy to prioritize patient care. Mame Darkwa um, is as well a second year Master of Health Sciences student in the Translational Research Program. She is currently working alongside CAMH to address wait times in the, at their bridging clinic and hopes to uh, integrate her passion for health equity into this work. Uh, finally, we will close the segment with a presentation delivered by Dr. Yamna Ali. And Dr. Yamna Ali is a first year pediatric resident at the Hospital for Sick Children and has completed her medical school and master's of public health and epidemiology at the University of Toronto. So without any further delay. Um, Tanja and Samira, you're welcome to go ahead and begin your presentation. Thanks, Gagan. And I just wanted to add a note. Uh, if you, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of these three presentations. So as they're going on, if you want to drop any questions you have to Kajani, the host named Kajani, she will be moderating the Q&A. Thanks. Jodhan, Samira. Um, our next presenters, if you're ready, Sabrina, Salim, and Mame, uh, you're welcome to begin when you're ready. Awesome. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Um, so good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for attending. Um, so uh, Mame and I uh, are uh, second year master students uh, at in the Translational Research Program and we're presenting today on behalf of the Anti-Racism Committee at the TRP, which I will now refer to as the ARC. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences trying to drive home uh, meaningful, concrete, and sustained anti-racism work uh, within the Translational Research Program. Uh, framework and also within the Translational Research Program. So in terms of uh, our discussion today, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are, um, this uh, survey and survey uh, learnings that we conducted and a little bit about what we learned from that, um, some collaborations as well as some of the work that we're doing and, and really important, I think, learnings that we developed out of these uh, experiences. So in terms of who we are, um, as I had mentioned, we are the Anti-Racism Committee or the ARC at the Translational Research Program or the TRP at UST. And really the purpose of our committee, which was born in August of 2020, um, is really to hold the TRP accountable to meaningful, concrete and sustained anti-racism work, but also to support members of our community belonging to racialized or underrepresented uh, minority groups. So part of the translational research framework is to uh, uncover needs uh, of people uh, from diverse communities and, and, and backgrounds. And so while each of us uh, coming from our own uh, racialized communities uh, had our own understanding and experiences with, 
with what we believed to be, for example, discrimination and so forth, we felt that it was really important not to, to generalize about our own experiences, which is a really hard thing to do, I think, uh, within the context of, um, as I'd mentioned, anti-racism. Um, so what we did actually was we conducted a survey uh, of students and community members within uh, the TRP. And really the purpose of that was to survey students' experiences and understanding of, of racism and anti-racism within personal and academic contexts. And, and then that was really important for us given that oftentimes there's a, there's a blur, uh, especially in Zoom University, uh, between personal and academic life. Um, and the method that we used that to, to do this was to survey students um, and community members from June to July. And we were fortunate to receive 27 responses um, from current cohorts and alumni. And we also received comments and feedback uh, from students uh, by email. So some key learnings, um, as well as uh, some of the findings that we really generated from this experience was that TRP students uh, felt unprepared to conduct needs assessments within underserved and racialized communities within, uh, as I had mentioned, the translational research framework. For us, this was really important uh, in the sense that there's an added sensitivity and a layer of understanding when it comes to trying to understand the needs of communities and, and the, within historical context as well. Um, the, second, the second learning that we had was that racialized students really voiced the need for support uh, from the TRP regarding uh, discrimination, uh, whether that be at the student level, the institution level, or even just at a policy level. And the last learning that we really had was was that students wanted to see increased representation in translational research spaces and to see that uh, there are people who almost who look like them um, that are doing work within this space. So this drives home the need that we were uh, eventually uncovering and the way that we decided to address that, which Mame will so graciously, graciously take forward, is that there's a need for long-term sustainable learning on health equity um, that challenges students and trainees beyond workshops and guest lectures offered in the TRP and the Faculty of Medicine. And my co-presenter, Mome, will take on from here. Uh, thank you, Sabrine. Um, so moving forward with our need in mind, we realized very quickly um, that it would not be an easy task to accomplish on our own and that we would need support from our program. And so we reached out to the TRP for a collaboration in hopes that it would help us achieve our goals and help things move forward. So through our collaboration with the TRP, we hope to accomplish a few of these things. First, we hope to amplify and prioritize BIPOC voices in the TRP community to ensure equity, diversion, and inclusion. And using these EDI principles, um, we hope to in, um, incorporate them in education and in the discipline of translational research and medicine. As well, we hope through our collab collaboration that we can create a safe and conducive learning environment for all students from uh, diverse backgrounds and with diverse identities. And most importantly, we hope to challenge the status quo to examine biases and systemic racism as it pertains to translational research and within the TRP. So going back to our need, we really wanted to to accomplish EDI work that was sustainable or that is sustainable and work that goes beyond workshops and guest speakers. So with this in mind, we decided that it would be a good idea to develop a mandatory health equity module for our program. And the purpose of this module would be to introduce students to health equity and real life applications of health programs, policies and tools to improve the health of underserved populations. And during this module, students will have the opportunity to participate in a series of workshops and interact interactions um, that focus on health equity. Students will be provided with an opportunity to develop professional skills needed to adopt anti-oppressive and anti-racist lenses as they navigate the complexities of translation and research in healthcare and in health sciences contexts. Um, we're working with the TRP currently and the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology to work out the logistics and feasibility of this health equity model, module. Sorry. Um, and what has happened is that our program has applied for a special topics module and they're working to get uh, this approved. And we're hoping to use the special topics module uh, to teach health equity within our program um, and look into maybe moving forward to providing uh, the course to uh, students within the Faculty of Medicine. And although since we've come together 
together as a, a community a committee and we've been able to accomplish a lot since then. There's still a very long way to go. Um, and this work definitely comes with its own unique set of challenges. And we thought we'd take some time to share some of those with you. So first, although we have received some support from the TRP, um, it's been quite challenging to maintain faculty engagement. Um, and this has been one of the biggest challenges that we faced. Um, another challenge we have faced has to do with funding. Being a new committee within the Faculty of Medicine and trying to figure out exactly where we fit in, it's been quite difficult to navigate the system in terms of how we can obtain funding for our activity and even stuff like the module um, as we would need an instructor um, to run uh, the module. So it's been quite difficult because we're all pretty new to this on the, on the committee. Also, so that has been a great um, learning experience uh, for us, although it has been challenging. Finally, I think the greatest challenge we have faced is navigating and understanding the University of Toronto's policies and our faculty's policies in regard to committees and how they operate. Although we have had some challenges along the way, we have learned quite a lot and we thought we'd take some time to share some of our key learnings from our journey. I think the biggest key learning is that institutional change takes time and there's no quick fix and that this work is an ongoing progress process. We also learned that throughout this process, there's lots of EDI work being done across the Faculty of Medicine, but it's quite disconnected. Uh, so moving forward, we hope to work with other committees across the Faculty of Medicine who are also doing EDI work. Specifically, we look forward to working with the Wellness, Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Committee uh, within the Department of LMP. Finally, we've learned that it is important to stay committed to our passions and identify needs while also doing work that is achievable and realistic. I think mainly we are concerned or we hope to uncover translational approaches that can positively impact the health of marginalized groups. This is quite a huge goal, so we've learned that it is important to find feasible ways to achieve this, even if it's on a smaller scale. Uh, so the, that are some of our key learnings uh, from this process and what we've, we've uh, grown to learn as a committee. And thank you for listening to our presentation and we would love to hear your thoughts or answer any questions you have. Thank you. So we'll take the questions at the end of all the presentations, but thank you again for identifying and addressing some of the EDI needs in the TRP program at U of T. Um, barriers in navigating the system are unfortunately a common reality. Um, and for those involved in equity work. Uh, and we welcome you to share those and everyone else in attendance um, in our networking session, which will follow the presentations. So for the final presentation, Dr. Yamna Ali, uh, whenever you're ready to go, um, we welcome you to share your screen. Perfect. Um, so thank you again so much to the organizers for putting together this event and for creating the space for us to really have these really important conversations. I'm Yamna, I'm one of the pediatric residents um, at the University of Toronto and I'll be presenting work that myself and Dr. Uh, Dr. Adrian Davis are planning to do in the Sick Kids Emergency Department. And we're looking at the exclusion of participants with limited English language proficiency and clinical research participation. Um, so living in Toronto, we're very fortunate to be living in such a diverse city. It's projected that by 2036, um, more than 75% of people living in Toronto will be either immigrants or Canadian born children of immigrants. It's also projected that by 2036, about half will have neither English nor French as their mother tongue. In Sorry. 2011. Dr. Ali, um, it seems your presentation is, okay, never mind. Sorry, it has corrected. Thank you. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> and it's also projected that in 2036, about half will have neither English nor French as their mother tongue. And in 2011, um, there were 42% of people living in Toronto that had neither English nor French as their mother tongue. Um, now, given that uh, Toronto has this uh, diverse ethnic and linguistic diversity, it's essential that clinical research is inclusive and the knowledge that we generate is generalizable to the patient populations we serve. And we know that this may not always be the case. Um, studies have shown a large variability in the representation of participants that have limited English proficiency. 
in adult populations, anywhere between nine to 74% of studies have been quoted to exclude speakers who have limited English proficiency. As well, anywhere from 42 to 84% of studies don't even mention language considerations at all, um, which makes it very difficult to know whether this uh, specific study is generalizable to the populations we're working with. Um, and without the inclusion of individuals with limited English proficiency, the value of research findings and the applicability to the populations we serve, particularly here in Toronto, becomes questionable. Um, and this systematic bias is especially applicable in the pediatrics world as a majority of consent is uh, from caregivers. And so children with an immigrant background may be at a higher risk of exclusion um, since their care caregivers may be of more limited English proficiency than their children. A study conducted within the Department of Anesthesia at the Boston Children's found that although the proportion of non-English speaking patients within their department increased from nine to 15% from 2011 to 2016, the proportion of non-English speaking patients approached to be enrolled in their studies only increased from eight to 9%. As well, there were differences in enrollment rates with 77% enrollment rates of English speaking patients and only 62% enrollment rate among non-English speaking patients. And this work in looking at uh, the exclusion of populations who speak limited English has not been investigated in the pediatric emergency department and we want to further explore it in the context of Toronto with its uh, ethnic and linguistic diversity. So this is where our project comes in. Um, and our work will have three major objectives um, and which will be done in three different parts of our work. Um, and I'll explain each of these different objectives in the next few slides. So the first part of our objective will be to first identify um, what is a proportion of studies that are conducted currently at the SickKids Emergency Department that have non or limited English speaking as an exclusion criteria. So for this, we'll be reviewing the REB database for studies conducted uh, within the SickKids Emergency Department. We'll be reading through the protocol to identify the proportion of studies that exclude populations that have limited English proficiency. And for those that do exclude this population, we hope to further learn their rationale for doing so. We also want to go through the protocol to identify studies that included language consideration in the protocol. And for those studies um, that do include uh, folks that have limited English proficiency. We hope to look for any stated strategy or plan for inclusion of these populations that do have limited English proficiency. The second of our objective will be um, to understand the rates of limited English proficiency speakers among patients who are approached and consented for ongoing studies within the SickKids Emergency Department. And this part of our work will be a cross-sectional design where we hope to gather data for the patients being approached and patients being consented for research studies within the Sick Kids Emergency Department. Specifically, we want to answer the following questions. So of those approached to be included in studies, how many have limited English proficiency? Of those consented for studies, how many have limited English proficiency? And of those declining consent, how many have limited English proficiency? And we want to further look at whether um, those who have limited English proficiency are over or underrepresented in these different groups. And we also want to further look at the enrollment rate among the patients with LEP and see how this compares to enrollment rate among the patients who do not have limited English proficiency. Um, and lastly, the third objective will be to understand and describe barriers and facilitators to participating in clinical research in the pediatric emergency department. And this will be done in the form of semi-structured focus groups of caregivers who have LEP. Um, and we, we will be doing focus groups for those whose primary language is Cantonese, Mandarin, or Arabic. Um, and we pick these three languages as they're the top three requested language um, languages um, requested in the emergency department at SickKids and 70% of all calls to our language lines are for these languages. And some of the questions we hope to discuss include asking participants what they think um, are some of the reasons that families who have LEP are not asked to join research studies, as well as asking what participants think um, might help families with LEP be invited into research studies. So some important considerations that we're working on in the planning stages of this work um, are as follows. So the first is to really think about 
how to best engage with individuals who do not want to wish to be consented to be a part of other studies, while also ensuring appropriate representation and not biasing our sample. Um, and we're thinking of different ways to collect information for all patients being registered in the sick kids emergency department, such as collecting information for all people on language preferences and or if interpretation is needed. Another consideration is how to really engage and communicate with those who have limited English proficiency um, and whether we can be more effective and have a wider reach with using language line versus translating um, our materials. And this leads us to really think broadly about how we can further enable future studies to include those who have limited English proficiency, such as by encouraging language line or encouraging folks to translate their materials or encouraging folks to validate their tools in different languages. Um, and with our work, we really hope to ultimately inform in developing and testing an inclusive research model that effectively um, includes individuals from diverse backgrounds into research studies, particularly here in the Sick Kids Emergency Department. Um, again, this is a work in progress and is still in the planning stages. So I'm very happy to take any suggestions you may have um, about this work. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Lee. Um, very important kind of um, work that really outlines the importance of uh, systemic and structural issues underpinning um, uh, uh, clinical research. Um, so in this next section, I will let Kajani um, take it away with the questions. Hi everyone, thank you for your presentations. I have uh, two questions for the first two presentations. So that will be Tanjot, Samira, Sabine, and Mame. Uh, what would success look like for your initiative uh, what do you wish staff and faculty would do or change to better support these types of student initiatives? Um, I could take an answer from Tanjot and uh, Samira. I can definitely start and Samira, if there's anything that I missed, you can definitely chime in. <laughs> um, I, I know for the symposium in and of itself, like one of the hopes is developing a network with students that are interested in the same type of um, conversations because you know they're kind of happening in silos and we want to make sure that there's a little bit of an integrated communication going on um, but that's one of the biggest motivations um, was there anything else to add Samira? I also wanted to add in addition to that that we're really hoping that the conversations that we can have together with like like-minded students students across uh, the different programs in the country can allow us to kind of like push the agenda in terms of like representation within the profession when it comes to who's represented in um, within the context of faculty um, pre preceptors and also students in the program which I think is like one of the first steps to um, incorporate like the, the transformative change aspect of like what we're hoping to see. And so we're really hoping that we can kind of like create um, a sort of space that allows us to strategically um, advocate for this so that it could be, so this type of um, change can be implemented sooner rather than later. Thank you both. And I feel if Sabine and Mami could take the question as well. Yeah, I can, I can definitely start here and we'll follow the same kind of structure as Tenzad and Samira. Um, so I'd say that um, our kind of, I guess, goal, uh, as we had mentioned, is ensuring that, I think within the grand scheme, what we are hoping for and what we're aiming for is that um, the, the, the work as a whole within translational research that it be incorporated and an understanding um, and I guess have the infrastructure and the support to understand the needs of, of, of diverse communities and, and specifically underserved communities. I think that that is the goal and the start of that goal really exists within, um, within training uh, people to become translational researchers. And so that's why we felt uh, doing work within this space and within the space of education um, is a way to ensure, I guess, um, that meaningful and long-term and sustained work. Um, the module that we're proposing is, is definitely, it's a start. It's not the end solution and it's not the solution for everything, but I think it, it provides 
uh, people with some sort of foundation to work off that maybe didn't necessarily exist before um, so that we can encourage uh, this, this sensitivity and the skill set uh, to be able to, to support uh, communities. I don't know if Mami uh, wanted to add anything here. Yeah, no, I think that was very well said. And I think the, the key point is the sustainability aspect of it. Um, I think while this uh, committee has allowed us to start a very important conversation, uh, we really hope that it continues to move forward, um, that even after we graduate, we can come back and see more modules, see more guest speakers of color, um, and really see that this program is preparing people to go into the healthcare or the field of medicine uh, with these EDI principles and mind um, and with these skills to be able to better serve these um, underserved or underrepresented uh, communities. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Yamna Ali. What is the harm that is caused when non-English speakers are excluded from health research due to language barriers? What would you like to see shift in healthcare research to remove xenophobic uh, practices? I think some of the harm in not including um, those who don't speak English in research, effectively, you, we can't really say whether the research findings, whether it's looking at particular drugs, whether it's looking at uh, particular tools um, for diagnosing or whatever it may be, we can't really extrapolate that information to those who are non-English speaking for various different reasons. Um, and it really becomes hard to also then engage uh, with those populations and really translate the material learned in research into those populations. Um, and research has previously shown that the exclusion of different races, whether it's for um, different drug trials, um, has actually been detrimental as um, the benefits and the risks are not the same in, in different uh, race groups or in different ethnic groups. Um, so it's really important then in every stage of any research that we do, we are uh, making sure that we're inclusive of all populations, whether it's uh, those that have linguistic diversity or different ethnic diversity, um, because it really becomes questionable whether we can extrapolate that information. And it makes it difficult for practitioners to also use research to determine um, whether the particular patient that they're seeing in front of them would benefit from a particular treatment or management plan based on research that wasn't inclusive. Um, and the second part of your question. All right, the second part was, um, what would you like to see shift in healthcare research to remove xenophobic practices? Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think first is for all those that are sort of undergoing in research um, to get a, a better sense of what is their population um, that they're working with, it becomes very easy to sort of um, cut through some of the struggles with just, for example, with like limited English proficiency. It, I can understand that it would be very difficult to involve those that do not speak the mainstream language of English. Um, sometimes researchers use particular tools that are only written in, in, uh, in English, and it becomes hard to sort of begin to understand, A, how do we translate all of this material into different languages and really how many languages are we going to do that for. Um, so I think it's it's easier to sort of cut through these hoops and just eliminate it all together. Um, but I think part of our work is to also be iterative um, in our process and to find different ways and tools um, to help researchers um, to further think more broadly about the populations that they're serving. Um, and to really help with um, helping through the barriers that researchers may have in this work. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, this question is for all three presenters. What would you like to see uh, UFT's Faculty of Medicine do to help better support these types of anti-oppression based research projects and initiatives? And how can these types of projects be continued on an ongoing basis? ask uh, Sabine and, uh, and uh, Mame to start off. Yeah, sure, <laughs> to start off. Um, so I would say that um, symposiums like this one are definitely a great idea. I think the greatest thing, and, and Mame mentioned this in, in our presentation, is um, that oftentimes 
possibly because of the size of the faculty of medicine and I think even the diversity of, of trainees and, and fields um, that oftentimes the work within, uh, you know, anti-oppressive work and anti-racism work is, um, I think, segregated uh, and by into like your own, like, you know, fields and whatnot. Um, so I think finding ways to maybe um, interconnect these um, initiatives or to um, create spaces where um, there might be more room for collaboration um, would be something that I, I could probably think of. Mommy, well, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, that was a good point. Um, I think for me, it's, it's initiative. Um, and I think that like sounds like really simple, but I think just even having faculty members like reach out with their own ideas or their uh, personal goals uh, for this type of work is really important. Um, I think like without that often this work tends to like fall on students and those students tend to be people of color, um, which kind of puts us back in the same place or like in the same cycle if we're not getting that support from them. Um, and I think the sustainability aspect is that once I think we've taken the step to start these conversations, it would be nice to see maybe faculty members um, or members of um, the faculty of medicine take steps to kind of continue this work, um, not necessarily for us, um, but in a way that is supportive that, you know, when these students leave, they have no worries that once they've left, this work is going to go to waste or this work is going to stop. Thank you. If uh, uh, Tanjot and Samira could take the question next. Um, yeah, I think um, in my experience with our program in particular, I, what we kind of notice is that there's more of a need to continue the conversation. And there definitely is work being done to educate us and our peers, but it, it kind of just feels like it's not enough. And to echo what was said previously, it definitely does feel like the responsibility kind of falls on our shoulders to um, kind of see that progression. Um, and I think just to kind of echo again, it's really looking for that type of support in our initiatives and it does exist, but maybe it's always not in the way that we want it, for example. So it's kind of even navigating and asking what we want to be particular about what it is that we want to ask. So it's definitely something that we're considering how exactly it is that we want to be supported by the faculty. Um, it's definitely an ongoing conversation. And then to just add on to what everyone has already um, expressed is, I think it's also like one way to support these types of conversations and initiatives um, is to have these types of dialogues embedded within curriculum to also set the precedence for students that um, like a one size fits all approach is not appropriate. Um, and that it's a, like, we should be having conversations about health inequities and how, it, how these disproportionately impact Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and that it's not just on uh, it's not just on the basis of students that are supposed to be creating these small dialogues and finding opportunities to think about how we can change and reimagine things, but um, like having the curriculum reflect that it's not okay to um, set up protocols and standards that are intentionally only meant to support um, a, like a set. Um, demographic and significantly um, disimpact the rest of us. And so I think the precedence, the precedence should fall within curriculum to also make it easier to bring up these conversations in ways that can also support like meaningful change um, in terms of like pushing out like future clinicians um, who will then be taking care of like, um, like people experiencing disability and health concerns across the country. Thank you. And Dr. Ali? Um, I think work that I would really like to be seeing done is for um, all departments that engage in research to really think more broadly about how to further enable researchers to allow them to incorporate different populations into their research study design and also really question um, all research into why certain populations are excluded. Um, I think it's easy to say that they should be excluded because our material is only in English, but I think it's important to always sort of go back to the principles of um, does, does that really affect what the research findings that we do and how does that impact the population and to really, um, for even the REB boards to really be considerate of why 
people are particularly choosing certain populations to be excluded and to question that across all boards, whether it be language considerations or other considerations. Thank you. And the last question for all three uh, participants, uh, sorry, all three presenters is, um, what is one call to action you'd like to leave us with or question you would want us to consider? Um, if Dr. Ali could start off that. Um, I think one question that has really come up for me is to be very mindful now of um, anytime we use um, in medicine, anytime we use any sort of clinical research to guide how we uh, will manage our patients. I think one question that has come up now, given the work that I've been doing here is to really think about who were the people that were included, but uh, specifically also who were the people that were excluded um, from particular studies or from particular line of work um, and how we can be better engage with populations that have been excluded. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And uh, if Tanjot and Samira could take this next. It's a tough one to answer. There's so many things that come to mind. <laughs> um, but I think a big one that pops up in my head is um, it's never like a checkbox that you just, uh, you know, check off and you're like, oh, I've done my work to be more culturally sensitive or, you know, educate myself more about a certain population. And I think that's the mentality that I've seen in my program and in our peers. It's like the way that the curriculum kind of goes. It's, um, you know, we've covered the specific part of it. So now let's move on to all these other aspects of the, you know, of our, of our program. Uh, I think it's kind of just having this mentality that it's an ongoing process and it's a journey and kind of taking on that responsibility of educating ourselves and those around us to never stop having conversations about this. I like two things that come to mind, if I may share. Um, the first one being that I think it's really important to have these conversations and to always think about how care could, could be different, to not just follow the status quo, to follow uh, protocols, but to constantly like, uh, question ourselves and ask ourselves, is what we're doing appropriate for the people that we're serving, um, for one. And then another point that comes to mind is like the importance of like reimagining. Um, and like in these conversations that we're having to always ask ourselves, how can things be different and be better? And um, keep that in the forefront of our minds that like we, like we are the future of change. Um, and we can always, we should always be continuing to reimagine how rehabilitation, medicine, um, and healthcare could be different to meet the unique needs of the different populations that make up Canada. Thank you. And if, if um, the last two could take the question. Um, yeah, that's, I think also that's, um, it's a, it's a question, it's a hard question, I think also, like, I think there's many call to actions within, I guess, different spaces. I think one of the things that I can think of, um, which was touched upon by uh, Mame, I think in the previous question, is this concept of, of what falls under, I think, student um, jurisdiction and, and student work and what falls under, I think, uh, faculty work and institutional work. Um, I think oftentimes, like as students, given that um, if we look at like UFT as an institution, we kind of fall on um, within the power hierarchy sometimes um, in the bottom. And I think it's, it's very difficult for us to, I think, advocate and um, to push forward work within like this very complex um, like system. And, and I think it goes to show the, the power, unfortunately, of like systemic racism and, and systemic um, oppression. Um, so I think one of the things I, I would think of is to find ways to have, um, I think, outside of, um, outside of like committees like this one and, and, uh, and, you know, for example, the Office of Inclusion and Diversity, I think finding educators um, or encouraging educators to be champions, I think, within uh, this field and to, to, to really push forward student efforts or to, to almost uplift, I think, student efforts is something that I would say um, is a call to action. 
um, just to really, yeah, I think I think sometimes it's as 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 we mentioned in our presentation, sometimes it's hard for us to to, to navigate. I think uh, different parts of the institution. So, I would say the call to action is um, to find ways to um, to motivate and to uh, integrate um, educators into into this work. Um, yeah, I think for me, I'm just going to um, add on to what Samara said. I think um, it's important in this work to hold yourself accountable, not only on the system or institutional level, but in your personal life as well. Um, and really make sure that while you're having these conversations publicly and at talks like this, that in your personal lives and your small spaces, you are really advocating for race equity um, and health equity um, and making sure that you are speaking up in those moments that matter and challenging um, uh, those status quo or dominant um, white culture <laughs> um, that we often see um, in um, health and medicine today. Thank you all for all your answers. I'm going to let uh, Gagan take over. Sure, yeah. Um, so we will be taking a short, uh, thank you again for that, you know, like rich uh, discussion. So um, for sharing your research projects and initiatives and um, also the attendees thoughtful questions and the uh, pre uh, presenters thoughtful responses. So um, theme for the theme for block A is anti oppression uh, initiatives in the postgraduate medical education program. Uh, and our first set of presenters will be jointly um, giving a presentation. They are Drs. Bonnie Chung and Ashna Asim. And Dr. Uh, Bonnie Chung received her medical degree from the University of British Columbia and is currently a third year pediatrics resident with the University of Toronto and planning on practicing general pediatrics with a focus in advocacy and underserviced populations. Uh, Dr. Ashna Asim is from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and she received her medical degree from Queen's University. She's currently a first year pediatrics resident uh, in the, within the University of Toronto. Our second set of presenters uh, will be Drs. Nikita Kiran Singh and Hayoung, Hayoung Ro. Um, Dr. Nikita Kiran Singh is a PGY2 in internal medicine at the University of Toronto. She leads the program's resident interest group in social advocacy, RIGSA, and has interest in medical education, health equity, and the health humanities. Um, Dr. Rowe is a PGY1 in the internal medicine program at the University of Toronto. She is an active member of uh, RIGSA as well, and has an interest in health equity, care accessibility, and poverty elimination. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And whenever you're ready to go, uh, Dr. Chang and Asim, you're welcome to uh, take the floor. All right, can you guys hear me? Perfect. Um, and it's in the presenting view. Okay. So I'll get started. Um, so we wanted to start out because we thought it would be remiss to do an anti-O presentation without a land acknowledgement and wanted to take the time to emphasize that we're on the land of the Heron, Wendat, Seneca and Mississauga of Credit Valley. Here, this is one of the arts that's situated um, on, by one of our patients at one of the entrances um, of sick kids um, to remind us of the excellence of these populations and humble us in the type of work that we are going to be discussing today. So Ashna and I, um, like Gagan said, um, are pediatrics residents and we'll be presenting on behalf of the U of T Pediatrics Residency Program EDI Committee. Um, in a presentation titled uh, A Resident Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, a Mechanism for Programmatic Change. We'll be presenting on the development of an EDI committee at the residency program level, acknowledging that EDI is a heavy and sometimes abstract topic, and we hope to be able to show you what we are addressing at a bite-sized manageable chunk um, to make uh, systemic change more in our grasp. 
From our knowledge, uh, official residency program EDI committee doesn't exist in any other residency programs nationwide. Um, and I'm sorry for those who are joining us that are not in residency or med ed context, but for those not in medicine, hopefully this can provide some tips on actionable items um, that Dr. Ryan Havon was mentioning yesterday. So specifically in regards to our mission is to learn and adapt from existing experts in the field to optimize our learning and work environment so that it is diverse, inclusive and equitable, leading to excellence in training and patient care. Um, we must recognize to meet the CanMed's goals, EDI cannot be left out of any one of these roles and is truly intersectional. And we hope by addressing our mission to be able to become a blueprint for others to establish similar, similar committees and also to adapt the mindset that we have um, to acknowledge the continual learning that is part of EDI. So our committee initially developed as we recognize that medicine takes place in a highly diverse society and we must be proactive to diversify medical culture ideas and personnel to mirror and be inclusive of the population that we serve. Medicine can't be done in isolation without acknowledging marginalization and its social issues and giving these populations a seat at the table. So for example, in our selection committee, we focused on personnel that would reflect the population that we serve, but also being acutely aware that as people in this point of our career, we have already been very privileged. Our members include peoples from a variety of social economic status backgrounds, gender identity, race, ethnicity, as well as chronic and hidden diseases, and as well as taking into account our experiences in this field as well. So our goal is to identify, address, promote, and apply EDI concepts in existing committees um, and policies with an anti-oppressive and racist lens, and also develop new solutions to the gaps that are identified. And we're specifically determined to recognize the impact of existing biases and hidden discrimination in our system and bring them to the forefront to be evaluated. I'll pass it on to Ashna. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, can I just give a thumbs up that everyone can hear me? Great. Um, so at this point, we wanted to just take a step back and give a very high level uh, overview of what we mean by EDI, um, as the terms are sometimes co-opted and our goal is to address EDI in a meaningful, actionable manner as opposed to a performative approach. Uh, so for equity, we're speaking to removal of systemic barriers and biases. Um, diversity often speaks to representation. So as Bonnie was saying, recognizing healthcare team members should represent diverse lived experiences and be prepared to take care of patients from diverse lived experiences. Um, and finally, our committee acknowledges that diversity without inclusion would fall flat. Um, so inclusion implies a practice of ensuring all individuals are respected and supported. And our committee also recognizes that the work of EDI um, involves ongoing learning and reflection. So moving on to the next slide, um, the, um, this bell hooks um, quote that we see here on this slide um, speaks to the ethos of our committee um, and the concrete steps our committee aims to take to address the key issues of transforming consciousness um, and transforming structures. In a recent CMAJ commentary piece, Dr. Sharda and her colleagues emphasized the importance of anti-racism as a professional competence. Um, so at present, the, an anti-racist and anti-oppression um, framework are not really well established in Canadian medical education, which our committee feels is an important issue to address. I'll now um, just give a brief overview of the work our committee is doing. So at our initial meeting, recognizing that our goal was to bring principles of EDI to the forefront in residency training, we discussed what our vision for success would look like. So themes that emerged included, for example, training residents to recognize and address EDI issues, um, as well as to increase diversity and representation in the admissions process. We then used a speedy thinking exercise, essentially like a brainstorming exercise in which during a set amount of time, uh, committee members wrote down suggestions for tangible actions related to specific themes. We want to highlight that our committee operates through a consensus-based decision-making process. 
So the goal here is to reach a decision after thoughtful deliberation to reflect the group as a whole and not just the majority. So practically what this looks like is once we had a list of actionable ideas, every committee member voted um, for their priorities. When priorities did not match, we discussed in further detail to determine which action items A, may work better by partnering with another group to provide recommendations, B, if they did not meet the goal or fit within the scope of the committee at all, or C, require further analysis. So for example, using a PPCO process, which we can discuss during the Q&A if anyone is interested. So at this point, um, our committee is at the development stage in which we are working to flesh out tangible plans for ideas. So we wanted to give two examples of um, ideas or sort of ideas that we had. So a theme that emerged from our discussion was that of representation, visibility, and awareness. When thinking about representation, uh, we were thinking about firstly the face of our institution, meaning the spaces in which we provide care and where we are trained, as well as the face of our program, meaning the representation within our resident cohort and program leadership. An example of an easy to implement um, plan to reflect the values of EDI in our institution um, is the creation of pronoun pins for all our trainees, which is a project that is currently in the works. Another very important theme, um, which if we move on to the next slide, um, emer which emerged is education. Um, the art article here on this slide um, is an American example of including anti-oppression in a medical education curriculum and speaks to the fact that while there is a larger awareness of the role of social determinants of health and health disparities, there is very little attention to the role of healthcare professionals as agents of an institution in contributing to disparities through biased care. Our committee recognizes that a first step towards meaningful change is moving ourselves to a place of awareness and solidarity. And so to work towards this goal, our institutional allyship leads have already developed and have begun delivering allyship workshops geared towards learners and interdisciplinary staff. In a longer term goal that our committee wants to focus on is incorporating anti-racist and an anti-oppression framework into a longitudinal curriculum delivered specifically during ac protected academic time for residents. So as a starting point, uh, we have a protected, protected academic time slot in June, which is specifically devoted to EDI related material. And we've developed a curricular subcommittee that is currently planning this. Um, so that sort of brings us to the end of our presentation. These are just some examples of what we have developed and adapted, recognizing we have much learning to do as we go. We're hoping that this presentation will help provide a framework to develop a committee within your own working environments. And we look forward to partnering with and learning from other programs and hearing your questions during the question and answer period. Thanks so much for that amazing presentation. Um, and now I'd like to invite the second presenters to take over. And again, a reminder to, as we go along, you can drop your questions to Kajani uh, for the Q&A right after the set, uh, these two presentations. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nikita. I'm a PGY2 in the Internal Medicine Program. Hi, my name is Hayal, I'm a PGY1. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we're here on behalf of the Resident Interest Group in Social Advocacy, um, which is within the Internal Medicine Program. And we're um, going to discuss how the group came to be and how we've created a collaborative space for advocacy within our program. The creation of this group was born out of a conversation I had with Dr. Lisa Richardson when I first moved to Toronto as a first resident. I noticed that it was a lot easier to become a participant in advocacy projects as a medical student, and I was struggling to find the same infrastructure as a resident. Um, so I approached Dr. Richardson, and she's been an incredibly important mentor for us. She encouraged us to create this group and to collaborate with faculty in doing so. Uh, so by July 2020, we had um, put out a call um, to the entire program, and we're pretty large. I think we're the largest non-family medicine um, program within the country. Um, and we started out our meeting with 20 internal medicine reg uh, residents, ranging from PGY1s to PGY4. 
And in this first foundational meeting, three emerging themes uh, came to be. The first thing we discussed is that anti-oppression tends to be discussed in discrete moments of time throughout our education, rather than being a lens through which all of our learning occurs. We also noticed there's a significant gap between knowing the theory of anti-oppression, knowing that racism is wrong, knowing that discrimination is wrong, and actually having the confidence and skill set to implement disruptive practice. The third thing we acknowledged is that the patient voice and discussion of lived experience is often not centered, and this has been particularly exacerbated by the pandemic. So from these three key themes, um, two main project groups emerged, which we'll discuss now. So uh, from the first theme that Nikita discussed as a subgroup, we wanted to answer the question, why are we only talking about racism or oppression in certain discrete sessions? And um, how can we utilize anti-oppression as lens for our education? After brainstorming, we wanted to start by creating a concise document that every lecturer can use to guide their academic half-day lessons. And from our discussions, we arose our guideline for inclusivity, as you can see here. The document evolved very quickly with meetings every two to three weeks to consolidate our ideas together. And as you can see here, we highlighted the common terms used in medicine and redirected them towards inclusive per person first language. We also had specific examples um, and as well the resources um, that the lecturers can easily access or organized actually by specialty. This was reviewed by my, our uh, mentoring faculties and was approved by the academic half day committees. Um, the finalized version will be officially distributed um, on our website and through our newsletters. Our next step uh, with the guideline will be to consult a BIPAC uh, graphic designer to finalize our document and add graphic design that is consistent with our mission. Uh, we also aim for increased uptake by the teachers, not limited to this program, but across all departments of medicine. We also wanted to gather uh, through our discussion your input on how we can best evaluate this document. Um, our key challenges that arose from this guideline we identified in the process was tokenization, stereotyping. Um, we had thorough discussions to prevent the use of tokenizing or stereotyping examples and try to let our audience know of this challenge as well. In terms of our second project, it was born out of this uh, question of why is it so hard to do the right thing? So our second subgroup um, is called Practical Skills for Allyship, and we identified a need for residents and medical trainees to be able to learn and practice skills for disruption in a safe setting, acknowledging the unique power dynamics we face. We thought that this would best be achieved uh, through an allyship workshop. Um, Particular challenges that quickly arose that we wanted to address up front were how do we ensure people who are more vocal and have more power within our team don't monopolize speaking time? And how do we ensure responsible facilitation? And so we engaged in fairly explicit conversations about um, facilitators needing to be people with lived experience and that we would only have Black people speak about anti-Black racism, only have Indigenous people speak about anti-Indigeneity. Our first step uh, was adapting a workshop that had already been created by Dr. Lisa Richardson and Dr. Ayelet Cooper. The second was undergoing training ourselves by uh, faculty who had already given the workshop to ensure that we were trained appropriately. The third step was adapting the content to the unique resident context and uh, including more social sciences content in particular related to, uh, related to intersectionality. And the fourth step was delivering this workshop to the PGY1 residents over Zoom, which we did in December, using the breakout function for three groups. Um, and we discussed two cases of um, racism and allowed the residents the opportunity to practice uh, disruptive skills. These are um, a few screenshots from our presentation. This is one where we discuss how objectivity is overstated in medicine and can undervalue uh, subjectivity as a source of information through lived experience. And this is Aisha Yusuf Ibrahim, who is one of our PGY3s, just finished her Royal College exam, so she couldn't join us today, but she's discussing the principle of intersectionality. 
Right. So as Rixa, we understood the power dynamics, racism and oppression that exist in our everyday lives. Uh, we learned to address and act on injustices and inequities starting from our own program. Um, we felt that Rixa allowed us the residents a safe environment to discuss our passion um, and at the same time be a part of the community towards positive change as allies and persons with lived, lived experiences. Three kind of other key lessons we learned is when it was just so helpful to have a common space where all of us could meet. So many of us have pa um, passions for advocacy and activism, and we just needed to have a space where we could talk about it together to be productive in these ways. Um, another thing we realized is it can be very challenging to have these kinds of conversations over Zoom. They're already hard at baseline in person. And so losing that ability to read the room is something that um, we've been discussing. Um, a third thing is that we really want to, moving forward, focus more on how we can collaborate with patients directly. There are a lot of ethical challenges related to that, but we've started working with some patient advocates um, that our faculty have put us in touch with and are hoping to, to work more closely with them moving forward. And these are acknowledgements. Um, these are all the residents who are a part of our RIGSA team, and we're really grateful to have such an amazing team. And our faculty and supporting mentors, Drs. Lisa Richardson, Arno Kumagai, Jeanette Gogan, Ambrin Najib, Tarek Abdel Halim, and Anita Balakrishna very kindly reviewed our guidelines. Um, and yeah, this would be the section for our questions, comments, or discussions as we move forward with our uh, presentation. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your presentations. You know, organizing and um, integrating these social structures is so critical to uh, continuously document and, and address the needs um, in our respective institutions. So thank you for sharing your experiences with that. Uh, Kajani will now moderate the Q&A session. Uh, please indicate if you'd like your question to be asked uh, to the first set of presenters, so Drs. Bonnie Chung and Ash Nassim, or to the second set of presenters uh, who just went, Dr. Nikita Kiran Singh and Ha Young Ro. Uh, you're also more than welcome to ask them to both uh, uh, to ask the questions to both uh, presenters as well. So take it away, Kajani. Thank you, Kagan. Uh, thank you both uh, presenters for uh, the discussions so far. Um, I've got a few questions. Uh, these are for both presenters. Uh, what are some barriers you faced in engaging in these initiatives? And I would ask Dr. Ro and Dr. Uh, Singh to go ahead. I think we were very fortunate in that our program was very um, keen to incorporate this into an official program with under the, the program structure. Um, in speaking with Dr. Richardson, I think we were very lucky that because of the time we were working in, people were more um, open to including that. Um, I think particular challenges we've had are one, um, ensuring that the workshop was delivered responsibly. Um, we were initially offered kind of time as it came up and we had to say, no, we want to make sure that this time is available to the proper facilitators. And we want to make sure that there's representation in the facilitators that we have. Um, but they took our feedback very seriously. Um, the second thing that we're, I think, something we're more concerned about now moving forward is with the guidelines, how do we ensure people actually read them? And how do we ensure that we have a space for people to, to converse with us if they're unsure about how to do this? And how do we have a feedback mechanism in place um, so that if people notice any concerns, um, we're able to, to loop that back through them? And that's something we're working on with our, our program leadership. Young, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, I think I like I echo everything Nikita said. Um, in addition to that, like the guidelines, I do want to discuss like the evaluation piece of it because it hasn't been really um, uh, evaluated previously and hasn't been really implemented yet, but it is ready to be distributed. So we are hoping to gain uh, the audience's opinion on that as well. And if Dr. Chung and Dr. Asim could also answer that question, thank you. So I think our experience has been quite similar to um, Nikita as well as Hyun's. Um, one of the big things that I also had to address for them as well was inviting the, one of the barriers we had was trying to engage and having the ability as a resident run committee 
on how to bring facilitators that were not just in the academic and medical field um, to be our speakers and to be our facilitators. So that is one of the things that we're trying to um, access and figure out within kind of the funds that we have, um, how to do those as part of our um, workshops uh, that hopefully we'll be doing in June. Um, and one of those things is that we, uh, we're actually getting dedicated times four times a year to be able to do that. Um, so those are ongoing barriers that we have. And as well, we're also trying to figure out an evaluation process. Thank you. And a follow-up question uh, for that would be, what can the PGME departments do to amplify your initiatives and other student-led anti-oppressive work? And this is for both presenters as well. If Dr. Chung and Dr. Asim could start off for us. Um, so one of the things that Dr. Asim and I are both very passionate about is acknowledging that medicine and academia often are very isolating and how to um, be able to engage in this type of work in a non-academic setting that's exclusionary, that it goes against basically everything we're doing. We want to bring these people to, to, to the table. Um, and I think it would be helpful um, uh, in terms of the PGME to be able to assist us in um, bringing community members to be able to, to um, kind of get to, get to our goals. I think I'll just add, I completely agree with everything that Bonnie said. Um, something else that I think is um, very helpful for residents or students working on these initiatives is um, buy-in from program leadership. So I think that we're very fortunate that our program director is, um, you know, really championing and supporting um, this cause. Um, I think that sometimes uh, in sort of medicine, there is this culture of like professionalism and advocacy sort of are opposed. Um, and Dr. Charis speaks to that in her CMAJ commentary. If anyone hasn't read it, I really recommend. Um, and so I think it's sort of the role modeling that we also need to see um, from um, people in leadership positions of um, championing EDI and anti-racism, anti-oppression. Thank you. Um, if Dr. Singh and Dr. Rowe could also take that question, please. Sure, I can think of two things. The first is that we would love if the guidelines could be incorporated into any training that PGME does for resident lecture or for um, faculty lecturers and teachers. Um, I think it would be best be done um, in an interactive setting rather than, than just a document that's distributed and floating. Um, the, the second thing we can think of is if there was a way to have institutional support so that we could incorporate the patient voice so that we, for example, just compensation so that we're not asking for people to, to be working for free. We're really uncomfortable doing that. Um, but to think more critically on an institutional level of how we could do those sorts of things responsibly. Thank you. And uh, the last question for both presenters, um, med medical hidden curriculum and dominant culture of medicine can make it daunting to speak up and request transformative changes happen. How did you navigate this in moving forward with your organizing? And what tips do you have for others? Um, I could ask Dr. Singh and Dr. Rowe to go first. It is very scary. And I think that's why our entire workshop was framed around how power dynamics become so um, challenging as a resident. I think what I would suggest is to find someone you know will have your back first. And Dr. Lisa Richardson has been that person for us. Um, she's the vice chair of culture and inclusion within um, the Department of Medicine. Um, she's always had her back. She's always told us she would protect us if any issues came to be. And we, we really truly believe she's sincere in that. Um, she also has a lot of power and, and has done amazing work within this realm. Um, so when she goes to our program director, she goes to other people within PHEME and, and suggests that, you know, this work be done um, through residents and peer-to-peer and -peer residents to residents. Um, they take her seriously, and, and that's been very important for us. Um, so I think that has really helped shape the rest of the work we've done and made us feel more comfortable speaking out. And I think too, we've been lucky in that kind of the, the temporal context we're in right now, people are gaining a better understanding of this, 
where my understanding is even five years ago, it was a lot more challenging to incorporate this kind of work. Hi, Young, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so my personal experience as a PGY one, so the first year medical resident has been, has been that um, coming into this program, we a year prior, they didn't we didn't have um, RICSA, but I, I felt very comfortable joining RICSA as um, Dr. Sang has um, like organized it. And I was able to kind of contribute and discuss different topics that I, I felt very passionate about. And I think that's the key for really combating the the, the hidden curriculum that we mentioned before, like to have allies within your program, to have um, people that you can share ideas, bounce ideas from, and that will really help you throughout your residency as well. Um, so I, I, felt, I felt very good going through my first year and I, I feel that I'll have friends and um, allies going through. Thank you. Uh, if Dr. Chung and Dr. Asim could also take that question. Um, so I can I can speak to this um, just to echo um, what's already uh, been said. Um, I think Dr. Rai spoke to this yesterday as well about um, seeking community, so finding people within um, you know your medical whatever your community is, your working groups who are like minded, who um, are passionate about the same subjects. Um, and definitely when you have someone in a leadership position who is backing you, like I think we're very fortunate that our program director, Dr. Atkinson, um, has been extremely supportive. Um, that can really um, sort of help because it can, it can be scary as it's already been said. And I think for me personally, I just think about, you know, why I came into medicine in the first place and to sort of um, make uh, my approach to medicine more patient-centered. Um, and that part of my job is to um, take a social justice approach to healthcare. I, I don't have much more um, to add. We do also have um, Dr. Indra Narang, who is part of the official, uh, not just our program director who's backing us, but um, I've had several conversations with our Department of Pediatrics um, head of EDI committees. So just separate from, from our residency program, the entire department and Dr. Indra Narang has been very, very supportive of um, all of this. And I think it's important um, to also acknowledge that a lot of the people who are interested in this work are, visible like persons of color where we were also we also have this um biases of how we should act and also confronting within ourselves how to bring up that um that uh ability to address those things when it's everything that we were taught against um it's very hard for me to, to, to speak up just given that, like how I grew up um, and that I always, often feel like it's not in place and it's not my place. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have these mentors as well as co-residents like Ashna who I can speak to and, and kind of uh, talk about these frustrations. And I think that's very important to have as well in doing this work. Thank you, doctors, for um, on taking all our questions. I'm going to hand it over to Duggan. Sure. I actually had one last question, um, if that's uh, OK for me to ask. Um, uh, so do you have like plans to integrate sort of like crosstalk mechanisms between your two groups, or even groups between your groups and other resident specialties? Yeah, Ashna and I have already been talking on the side that we should probably be talking. <laughs> to Nikita as well as Hayoung. We were wondering as well, like, why, why are you guys currently more of an interest group rather than officially? Because Lisa, like Dr. Richardson is such a big name in all of this, like, why is it not part of your official curriculum? Because I know in internal medicine, there's uh, a lot of official stuff happening in terms of um, CARMs and uh, accepting applicants that's very focused on um, inclusion and why you guys are an interest group rather than official part of your curriculum. 
So we actually are an official part of the program. It's been integrated into the internal medicine program. So it's probably just linguistics. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's been uh, officially adopted through the residency program committee. Um, so it's just our name. And we actually chose that naming because we also have like a resident interest group in medical education called RICME. So the language, it's more a consistency piece. So it's it's not that we're just in an in interest group. It's it's formally been adopted into our program. I'm um, glad to hear that because yes, yeah. the work that you've shown is is amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that, that wording is probably a bit misleading. Um, but yeah, and I think Justin from your team, um, Lisa Richardson had um, tweeted about our guidelines when we were working about it. And then he was like, oh, we should collaborate. So I know over Twitter, we've, we've crossed paths. Um, and now that we're in the, the stage of distributing the guidelines very shortly, um, yeah, we would love to collaborate. It sounds like we're doing basically the same work in, in different programs. Yeah, that was one of the things that our program um, director had brought up, like in the U of T internal program came up quite a bit and hopefully we can get started on kind of collaborating as well. And then one other additional thing to mention is that our program director has actually is actually set up at their next pediatrics program director meeting to distribute these ideas um, nationwide. I don't know like cross residency programs and dis different disciplines, um, but it's definitely occurring in pediatrics throughout um, the na nationwide. And I actually, as a student, I wanted to do pediatrics before I converted to internal medicine. And I, in general, found that there's such a strong focus on social medicine within peds. Um, it, maybe because there's just more of a family focus in general. And, and I hope that we can kind of continue that sort of lens within internal medicine. To reflect on where they are right now and reflect on what wisdom they would impart on themselves as medical students. This podcast was founded by Mira Mahenderan and Maham Bushra, and it's also supported by our phenomenal audio editor, Happy Inibuni. So the podcast is also supported by the individuals on this slide who were so generous to give us their time and their wisdom. We hope that this list only continues to grow and we acknowledge that these folks are from equity deserving groups and they are generously sharing their energy and their wisdom with us for an hour without remuneration. Dear md to be reaches a wide audience through accessible and free platforms such as Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Yet we humbly acknowledge that these platforms come with their own set of structural barriers. Through such platforms, we have engaged with interprofessional colleagues, undergraduate students, physician mentors, and healthcare champions. So why is Dear MD to be needed? We as podcast co-hosts hope to remind listeners to embrace their diversity, to acknowledge the diversity that exists within our medical community, and to feel as though it is a subject to be celebrated and not concealed. This podcast came to fruition with the intention of telling medical students that they belong, to bring voice to the uncertainty and the imposter syndrome underrepresented medical learners experience, and further to bring visibility and representation to the cultural imposter syndrome that is often experienced on top of professional imposter syndrome. This podcast provides a platform for uninterrupted dialogue and mentorship whilst allowing healthcare champions to openly and reflexively discuss racism while remaining authentic in medicine. So how is Dear MD to be an anti-oppression tool? Well, it offers protected space for healthcare champions to share lived and living experience and challenge predominant narratives. It allows these champions to orate their lived experience and to practice telling their stories, to give it life and voice and meaning. It challenges the inaccessible structural barriers that safeguards these narratives in paid articles, journals, and textbooks. And finally, it is a space for discomfort, for all members to engage in critical self-reflection, to discuss institutional experiences and engage in liberation. We are trying to build a library of lived and living experiences that we can honor and love. Now that we've oriented you to our podcast, we wanna tell you a bit about our ongoing research. So we sought to answer the question, what wisdom is imparted to learners by healthcare champions from equity deserving groups when there is protected space to share lived and living experience? 
We took the 16 completed semi-structured podcast episodes from April 2019 to December 2020 and transcribed them verbatim. As the independent reviewers, we coded each transcript and used an inductive coding approach to independently generate emerging themes. We then compiled our themes in two superordinate concepts. Some of the emerging themes are on this slide. We recognize that this slide is overwhelming and we're not sharing it with you to read every single theme. What we want to convey is that the mentorship provided in this sphere really is grounded in healing, human connection, meaning making, and remaining authentic in an oppressive system. Interestingly, this defies the typical Western Eurocentric stereotype of mentorship in medicine, which has traditionally been paternalistic, focused on measures of performance and quite hierarchical. So we collated the 105 emerging themes into seven superordinate concepts that our podcast ultimately distills down to. These are authenticity, mentorship and connection, finding joy, navigating racism and discrimination, inequities in medicine, cultural and professional imposter syndrome and healing. We cannot possibly share all the wisdom that has been imparted to us in a mere eight minutes. But we really wanted to share with you a few quotes that really embody the rawness, candidness, and power of the mentorship that is shared on our platform. And I invite you to read them on the slide. We also invite you to listen, learn, and unlearn by engaging with our podcast while keeping our superordinate concepts in mind. From this preliminary analysis, implications can be generated. And these include the fact that our superordinate concepts that were experienced by established healthcare champions in practice today persist for current equity deserving learners. This data shows healthcare champions from equity deserving groups have beautiful wisdom to impart. And without formal and protected space and medical education, it remains an untapped resource. We encourage mentorship programs to harness the framework of our superordinate concepts, whether that be specialty specific, informal or formal mentorship programs to challenge the Western Eurocentric definition of mentorship. These superordinate concepts open opportunities for institutional leaders to respond to the shared experiences of racism, discrimination, cultural and professional imposter syndrome. This analysis provides direction for institutional responsibility and accountability. And finally, we have shown that joy, authenticity, mentorship and connection are important resilience factors. So our future trajectories include furthering this analysis into a more robust thematic analysis and actually quantifying the frequency of codes and themes. We hope to pursue knowledge translation and consolidate and publish this research endeavor to share it with the Canadian medical education community. And we are looking for healthcare champions to mentor us in this endeavor. So please email us if you would like to be involved. We will continue to record this podcast and provide protected space for reflection and liberation. And we hope to grow our podcast audience uh, engagement nationally. So if you have any questions, um, any feedback or want to be involved, please do not hesitate to email us uh, the emails on the slide and please do follow our social media to tune into the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. That was amazing, guys. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to Jean whenever you're ready. Sounds good. And again, great presentation, guys. That was a tough act to follow. Um, so just going to share my screen here. All right. <clears throat> so um, thank you again, Janaksha, for the introduction. But just to reintroduce myself. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jean, and I'm a third year medical student here at the University of Toronto. Um, and today I'm going to speak to you guys about an ethnic group that often gets overlooked, which is uh, Filipinos. And I know I just have eight minutes, so I'm going to get straight to the point, which is uh, Filipinos are underrepresented in Canadian medical schools. You know, starting off my first year in clerkship and being on the wards, I still have yet to see even just one Filipino doctor or even resident for that matter. Um, however, there are tons of Filipino nurses or even the cleaning staff, um, but still no Filipino physicians or residents. 
And you know, there's a lot of research to back this up. So a study in 2012 by Young et al. saw that out of uh, 1,495 Canadian medical students who filled out their survey, only five uh, were Filipino. So be, that being 0.33%. Uh, and when they compared that to census data at the municipal, provincial, and national level, they found that Filipinos, along with uh, Blacks and Latin American um, ethnicities, were found to be underrepresented proportionally to the population level. And these findings are also echoed, echoed in a more recent study by Khan et al. in 2020, which found that out of uh, 1,388 uh, Canadian medical students from 14 medical schools, again, only 11 were Filipino, so being 0.8%. And again, this is striking given the fact that Filipinos are the leading source of immigrants to Canada um, and the fourth largest visible minority in Toronto. So again, we're seeing that sort of uh, disproportionate uh, and underrepresentation. And so what else is the research telling us? The research is also telling us that Filipino youth have poor post-secondary um, achievement. So a really good study by Philip Kelly in 2014 um, used interviews with Filipino community leaders as well as statistical data to explore the educational and employment trajectories of the Filipino youth. And what he found is statistically, uh, Filipino um, men in particular uh, have the lowest rates of university graduation amongst all the other ethnic groups, as well as the highest percentage of trade and certificate diplomas. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of streaming of the Filipino youth into these more, I guess, um, trade or college programs. And qualitatively with his interviews with the Filipino community leaders, he found um, three factors that may be contributing to uh, these social mobility um, issues. The first one being family resources, uh, of course, including the fact that financial hardships uh, may result in little time for parental oversight or assistance for their children because the, the jobs that these immigrants' parents are working, um, they often have to work a lot of hours just to provide for the family. A second factor was the social networks of these Filipino youth. And they found that if these Filipino youth are in a predominantly Filipino circle, um, then this sort of leads to a vicious social, social cycle of everyone just going into the same path because the peers around them are in the same path. So what Philip Kelly described as labor market uh, marginality. And then the last point would be sort of this construction of the Filipino-ness or the Filipino identity. And again, this, re this relates to the underrepresentation um, and sort of the racialization, which we're seeing in the society. We're, see we're not seeing a lot of Filipino doctors or uh, people in higher sort of positions. And thus that sort of feeds into this mentality of the Filipino identity. Um, so that was very interesting. And of course, us being in the pandemic, it's worth mentioning that Filipinos are also disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, and so I mentioned earlier that there are a lot uh, and a lot of Filipino nurses. And despite the fact that they actually only make up 4% of nurses in the United States, they are consisting of 31.5% of nursing deaths from COVID-19, according to a report by the National uh, Nurses United. Um, and this is uh, the reason being that they're being deployed in a lot of areas that are heavily hit by COVID. They're put in these very intimate patient care positions where uh, they have to work very close with the patient. And oftentimes they're not equipped with the necessary PPI to keep them, uh, PPE to keep them safe. Uh, and a more specific example uh, that is closer to home would be the uh, recent Cargill COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so Cargill was a factory in Calgary uh, for which 70% of their workers uh, were Filipino, many of them being temporary foreign workers uh, with limited job mobility. Um, and they found that there was an outbreak there which they linked 921 cases to uh, which ended up being Canada's largest COVID outbreak. 
And due to the fact that a lot of these workers were Filipino, a lot of them were facing discrimination uh, in their communities in Alberta. So for example, a lot of them described being denied services at grocery stores or banks just be because people would associate the COVID-19 virus to these Filipinos. Um, so again, we're seeing sort of this discrimination that's happening against um, our particular ethnic group. And so with that being said, um, what are we doing about all this underrepresentation sort of uh, inequities? Um, and so to that end, I would like to introduce you all to the Filipino Association of Medical Students, um, or the FAMS, which is a group I founded in my first year, uh, which are essentially a group of medical students across Canada, but based here at U of T, uh, who are hoping to address the issues of equity and underrepresentation in medicine as it relates to our particular Filipino community. And the way we hope to do this uh, is through things like community outreach, mentorship, and research. Um, so to start with community outreach, we've held a lot of sort of um, community, community events in the past. So for example, on your left, you can see I guess half of her face, but that's Dr. Gigi Osler, who is the past CMA president uh, and who is also um, uh, of Filipino ethnicity. Uh, and she was able to give a talk just to pre-meds and medical students just to be really inspiring and discuss all these issues that our particular community is facing in terms of the underrepresentation. Uh, we've also reached out to local uh, newspaper outlets just in order to spread the word about this underrepresentation. And we've also teamed up with different organizations such as the Filipino Canadian Medical Association, uh, which you can see on the right. Uh, we were able to um, join their gala, fortunately, and I was able to see, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, do some Filipino cultural dance. Uh, so that was nice. Um, we also hope to address these issues of underrepresentation through mentorship, which is very important as we all know. Um, so we've teamed up with many different organizations, of course, one being the community of support here at U, U of T, um, and the second uh, being our most recent event, event which was uh, Panoise on Parliament, where we hosted sort of a, a med school one-on-one -on -one workshop for a lot of aspiring Filipino youth all across Canada. Um, in order to equip them with the knowledge that they need to succeed uh, in applying to Canadian medical school. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is our research. Um, so myself, along with Mark Mercado, who is a fourth year med student at U of T, and Dr. Ivy Wandasan, um, who you see on the bottom right, who's a prof uh, faculty here in the Faculty of Medicine, as well as the past director of education for the College of uh, Family Physicians of Canada. Um, so we're currently conducting a qualitative uh, research study that focuses on the reasons behind this underrepresentation that we're seeing of Filipinos in medicine, with a particular focus on the barriers that are impacting Filipino uh, pre-meds and their journey to medical school. And so we're just about wrapping up our qualitative data analysis phase but to share with you our preliminary findings, what we're seeing are essentially three categories. So of course, internal factors, which include the belief in self or their perceived ability uh, and sort of the personal behaviors and knowledge that may be acting as barriers to their journey to medical school. We're seeing external factors, uh, which can include things such as family, finances, um, the amount of social capital that one has, uh, their local communities that they grow up in, their peers, as well as their lack of exposure uh, to the healthcare system, all of which uh, other ethnic groups can relate to. Um, and then the last factor we're seeing are sort of these socio-cultural factors, um, which can be these family-centric uh, values that the Filipino communities have. Um, of course, the concept of immigration, uh, which many of us can relate to, I presume, and the barriers that immigrants face, but also things that are particular to the and unique to the Filipino community, which can be our sort of history with nursing um, and the encouragement that we've had to pursue that path as opposed to others, as well as this uh, barcada mentality, which is essentially means um, that one should stay uh, 
stay in sort of the route that everyone else is taking and not diverge from the norm. Um, otherwise, it will be frowned upon by the community. So that is as much as I can fit in the eight minutes that I was given. I apologize if it was a little rushed, but please feel free to reach out um, to me or to us, the FAMS, uh, if you have any other further questions, we'd love to connect further about this. Um, so please feel free to follow our social media. We have Twitter and Instagram, um, as well as a Facebook page, as you can see here. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for listening. Um, and I hope to connect with you soon. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Jian. And thanks um, to the other presenters also. I'm looking for names, Iman and Clara. So at this point, we can turn to questions from the group. Uh, so there are a couple have come through and please continue to send them if you're still thinking through a question. Um, so the first question is for uh, DRMD to be. <laughs> um, so when approaching difficult topics in the NTO and qualitative space, how do you connect with your participants and foster a safer space for these dialogues to occur? That's the first question. So I can take uh, this question and then Clara, if you have anything to add on, please do. Um, that's a fantastic question. Thank you to whoever asked this. Um, I think what we try and do is really allow the interviewer to, to drive the, the 45 minutes it's or an hour. It is their one hour of protected space and the ways that we try and, and um, foster safety and, and foster um, like sharing the lived experience that they want to impart with us is we give them a set of, of six questions. The six questions are, are very um, standard. Usually it's just about how they came into medicine, what their journey was like, what challenges they experienced, what successes um, did they garner in this path, and how they remain authentic in medicine. And then we ask that same reflective question at the end, um, which we mentioned in our presentation. Um, but we really do connect with our interviewees prior to our podcast recording. We send them these questions and, and ask them to reflect and, and whether or not there are topics that are missing or whether there are topics that they prefer not to disclose. Um, but, but the intention of the space that Clara and I are in and when we're hosting is, is really uh, interviewee and participant driven. Um, and uh, I hope that answers your question, Clara. If you have anything else to add, please. Clara, did you want to add to that or you're good? Um, I just wanted to say, I guess, like a quick thing, um, which Iman kind of alluded to. But I think the other thing is when we're hosting um, these episodes, we try to be really transparent with them about the space that we're creating. And we, we let them drive the conversation. Um, and we let them kind of take charge of the narrative. And I think that's something that's been really important for me and Amon. And it's been also a really great learning experience in terms of um, just creating rapport with people that you don't actually know. And what we've also learned is that we have so much more in common with so many of these interviewees um, in terms of their experiences. And so getting that wisdom is also all part of creating that space for them. Great, yeah, thanks for that. That's very intentional work that you're doing to create these safer spaces, which is um, so crucial to moving conversations forward. So thanks for that. Um, so this question is for Jian. Um, so, you know, your work is focused, you know, on the Filipino community. Um, has that focused any unique challenges for recruitment? Um, and also, you know, for those who are non-Filipino who want to support, um, you know, and support the work that you're doing, what are ways that they can uh, encourage support uh, Filipino youth in entering higher education and med school in particular. So it's kind of a two-part question. Okay. What are some of the kind of the unique um, challenges that you had and and how can others support you with those challenges? Awesome. So thank you so much for whoever asked those questions. Uh, those are very good questions. Uh, so to ask, answer the first one in terms of the particular barriers that I face um, in terms of recruitment, et cetera. Um, I think this is an issue that I guess um, other underrepresented ethnic groups can relate to in the sense that when you're trying to start these initiatives, 
the fact that we're underrepresented means that there's not many members to pull from, right? Um, so I know when I was talking to, for example, uh, the Black Medical Student Association and their early years and when they started, they often found themselves having one to two members. Um, and the issues of longevity um, were apparent because oftentimes there would be no um, Black medical students in their class. Um, and so we're, we're finding similar issues uh, in our regard. You know, I think my class was particularly lucky to have six students who identified with a Filipino background. Um, but in the years above and below, we only had two. Um, and so that was a particular issue in terms of recruitment and just keeping these initiatives alive. Um, and it's an issue that I suspect we will face in the years to come. Uh, but hopefully the initiatives that we're doing will raise awareness around this underrepresentation. Hopefully we'll see the numbers increase soon. And so in terms of the second question which you asked, which are how you guys can help. Um, so it's a really great question. And of course, I think the first step to that is really just raising awareness. Um, and that's why I'm giving these sort of presentations today. You know, in the study that I brought up by Young et al. in 2012, um, one of the things they commented on is that they were surprised to find this underrepresentation, underrepresentation of Filipinos. And something that they said was that they presumed that the Filipino identity, identity can sort of be lost in the greater uh, grouping of the Asian identity. Um, so we're often um, sort of hidden in that sort of overarching Asian identity. So raising awareness and, and sort of being aware and letting people know is definitely the first step. And the second would be just supporting all the different initiatives that are already happening. So U of T was really great by starting that community of support initiative. And that's really what gave the FAMS life to bring these initiatives um, to fruition. And we've seen similar things pop up at different medical schools. So Western has actually now started um, their access pathway, which specifically includes uh, Filipinos as a group, which they're targeting. Um, so we're very, very grateful for that. And we thank all the allies that um, contributed to that program uh, becoming a success. And so similarly for everyone here, you know, just supporting all these initiatives, um, raising awareness and, and keeping us in mind when there are discussions about equity and sort of bringing our voice to the table is what I would say. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Neha who had a question to share also. Neha, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much to all three of you for sharing the work that you've been doing. Um, one point of discussion that was brought up in the networking session that myself and Chantel were leading um, prior to this was the ways in which we can build solidarity between different groups. And I think Jean actually has just touched on this topic just now in terms of how working with the BMSA in the early days of FAMS was so important in sharing lessons and um, learning from another and what kind of were some of the barriers for BMSA in the beginning as well. Um, and I'm wondering in regards to even the podcast that Iman and Claire, you've been running, um, have there been discussions in which people have talked about um, potentially learning from each other's strengths and amplifying the, their voices and kind of looking at what are some of the similar sources of oppression and digging at those root causes that then go on to impact so many different groups in different ways because of different um, experiences, but sometimes those root causes are very similar. Um, and Jean, please jump in at any point as well. Yeah, I can take this question. Um, I'll address the second part of your question that will maybe kind of answer the first part. So I think when Iman and I were um, going through the podcast transcripts, we did see that there are so many kind of um, common themes between them. And I think one of the major um, themes that we, we found was this idea of imposter syndrome and how imposter syndrome manifests culturally as well as professionally. And this was kind of all across the board. Um, and it seems that a lot of it also has to do with just um, feeling that you don't belong in healthcare or in medicine. Um, and I think that was, that was pretty prevalent just across all these different identities. 
And so that was something that Iman and I really wanted to also bring attention to this idea of imposter syndrome and how it manifests differently. And what are some supports that can be given in that regard. So in terms of solidarity, I think it comes down to recognizing that there are so many, um, so many points of, of commonality between all of these different stories and narratives. And, you know, Iman and I have found ourselves like in these different narratives and these different interviews when we weren't even expecting it. So I think that in terms of solidarity, as I said, just comes to recognizing that we're all kind of represented in, in a lot of these um, concepts and these issues and that we can all actually contribute to, to addressing some of these issues and mitigating them. Yeah, I can uh, chime in as well. So thank you again, Neha, for that great question. Um, and I think you mentioned it, like solidarity is, is very important when it comes to all these anti-oppressive initiatives. And again, just to reiterate, um, I was heavily involved in, in the BSMSA in my first year, and that was very, very beneficial because I essentially used their work as inspiration and template for the fans. Um, and I think, again, even through my own personal research, um, and just comparing it to the research of my peers and my colleagues, we're seeing a lot of commonalities, as Clara mentioned, in terms of the narratives that these people um, are saying and their stories when uh, sort of the, and the different dis discrimination that they face in medicine. Um, and so I think that solidarity is very important. You know, I think that our, our um, similarities bring us together, but our differences also make us unique and strong in that regard. And I think that working together is just going to make us all better. Um, and so I'm very grateful for everyone here uh, who's sort of interested in these different initiatives, and I look forward to working with, with anyone. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for those responses, um, Gian, Iman, and Clara. Like, really nice advice and insights um, that we can take away and continue to reflect on. Um, another uh, request for some more advice and insights. <laughs> um, I'll start with Iman and Clara. Um, might you share with folks um, your advice or insights for those who are interested in carving out their own spaces and their communities, um, i.e. outside medicine in the digital space, like podcasts. So this is kind of getting more into the kind of the, the methods that you've used uh, to kind of move forward your work and any advice you might have for people who are trying to do this in their own spaces. Fantastic question. I'll start and then Clara. I know we're in a virtual format, so it's hard to, to share this space. So I, I wanna make sure that Clara can also contribute. Um, but fantastic question. I think when you think about ways that you want to tell a story, um, there's a lot of critical reflection that can go into that. Um, if you want to tell it in, in the written text or you want to do it via uh, videography or if you want to do it via podcasting. I think the reason why um, Dear md to be ended up being a podcast is because uh, the crux of our, our, our mandate, our mission is for storytelling and story listening. And so we wanted to give voice to the narrative and we wanted a lot to allow people to own that narrative in that space and I think different mediums and different digital mediums offer um, very different ways to to advocate and own like own the narrative and own the story um, in terms of advice of of sharing narratives and sharing stories I think um, one is just recognizing how much learning um, can occur at the intersection between storytelling and story listening. Um, Clara and I often, after a podcast interview, take hours to de de debrief the like mere 45 minutes of discussion because we learn so much more than we, we ever thought we would going in. Um, and, and so to, to really value and honor and love and hold space for narratives is, is such an important part of, of, of anti-oppression work and to listen and to listen intently. Um, and then to do more than listen and, and debrief with others and connect with others and, and, and share meaning in, in those words. So I, I, I encourage you to embark on storytelling and story listening. It's fulfilling, it's rewarding, and it's really beautiful. Clara, did you have anything to add? Um, and Gian, maybe just, uh, you know, as a last word, um, again, continuing kind of this, this trail around 
Um, you know, you talked about connecting with, um, with the Filipino community directly, um, you know, to kind of promote a lot of the, the work that you're doing. And so do you have any advice or insights for those who are trying to connect with their own communities um, to do, you know, anti-oppression equity work? Um, you know, what are some of the kind of the lessons learned or the kind of the, the strategies you use to connect? Um, you know, we, we feel a part of certain communities and not a part of others, even sometimes within our own diverse community. So uh, just wanting to wanting to get some thoughts from you on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, this is a really great question, because since the conception of the fam, this has sort of led to a domino effect of other culture groups saying, hey, like, if, if one can start that, why can't we too? So I've actually had people reach out to me about starting their own um, sort of uh, ethnic initiatives. One example being um, the TARM, so the Tamil Association of Residents and Medical Students. Um, so I think it was uh, Kaysavin, uh, who's also a, a student here at U of T, reach out to me um, and ask advice, the same question that you're asking about initiatives. Um, starting there. And another Korean student here at UFT also reached out to me to starting their own groups. And so the advice that I'll, I all give them is um, it's really just about taking the first step, you know, having that, that strong leadership, first of all, um, and sort of recruiting um, the personnel around you and surrounding yourself with a good group in order to drive the initiatives forward. But at the end of the day, it really does take that first step to, you know, reach out to the faculty, reach out to the people um, in charge and say, hey, like we, we are coming from this particular ethnic group. We face our own unique different struggles and inequities that all that other um, ethnic groups may or may not face. Uh, and we think that we should have a spotlight and have a voice at the table. Um, and so that's essentially what I did, um, you know, just he heading to U of T and saying, that this is a problem that we're facing. I think we should do something about it. And then the last advice that I would give is really finding um, a good mentor and a person who is already established in the field. And so I found that in the form of Dr. Ivy Wondasan, who works here at U of T. But I also did that through other inspiring mentors, such as Dr. Jeezy Osler, who I mentioned in the past uh, CMA president, and uh, Dr. Eileen Davila, who some of you may know, who is the public um, health officer of Toronto. So I think the combination of having strong student leadership, um, having a good recruitment uh, and a good team, and lastly, having a good mentor, and finally taking those three aspects and bringing that to the table to the people in charge, it would be my advice. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for ending us off on such a strong note. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that attended this breakout room to hear from students that, you know, are not only doing such a great job as leaders, but are also elevating the voices of their peers and everyone around us. And so um, thank you, Iman, Clara, and Jian for sharing your work with us and your experiences. Um, so thank you so much. Huge thank you to presenters from yesterday and today, attendees, Anita, Shannon, and Lisa from the Office of Inclusion and Diversity for supporting this, um, the lead committee and the lead working group, which includes Neha, Janaksha, ooh, sorry, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> oh, Neha, Gaga, and Janaksha, um, Helen, Yvette, Chantel, and Kejani, Wally from IT, closed captioners for both days, and our community as well, who are part of a lot of the attendees. Um, so big thank you to everyone for supporting this for the second time, and we hope to see you next year as well. And lastly, I have dropped the link to the evaluation survey in the um, chat. And so if you could take two minutes to just fill that out, that would really help us out for our symposium evaluation. But thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And please let us know if you have any last questions. Otherwise, have a good weekend. Hope everyone gets some vitamin D.